we've been looking at the book of 1 Peter. So we've been looking at this for the last couple of weeks, and we're now at the second last sermon on this series. And as part of this, I just wanted to look very quickly at the structure of this letter, 1 Peter. There we go. Because I think this will help you understand what the verses that I'm going to talk about today. So the simplest way to talk about or look at this letter from 1 Peter is to see that it has five distinct parts to it. The, the first two parts are what you'll see in all letters that are written in the New Testament. They have this opening greeting and a thanksgiving. So the opening greeting tells us who wrote the letter and who it was written to. So the author we know is the Apostle Paul. He's first known as Simon, one of Jesus' earliest followers, one of the 12 disciples. And at the time he's writing this letter, he is a key leader in the early church in Jerusalem. And he's writing this letter to Christians who are scattered throughout the province of Asia Minor. Right? So what we would call modern-day Turkey in lots of different areas around there. And the second part there, the... The Thanksgiving tells us, I guess, the occasion for which this, this letter is written. It tells us the reason that these people are being uh, written a letter by the Apostle Peter. And we know that uh, you might recall Pastor Margo spoke about that particular section. And it's where Peter argues that for Jesus' followers, persecution, or the persecution they're facing in particular, is like a purifying fire. Because it will burn away all these false hopes, false ambitions, and help focus their minds on this future hope that they have in Jesus' return. All right? And in that sense, it's kind of like a strange gift. It's one where life's hardships somehow act to deepen your faith. They make it genuine. And that's the main theme that Peter ties everything back to in his letter. And he says it up front in that opening Thanksgiving. And so from here, Peter moves on to the body of the letter, it's where those, we've got those three parts there. He's essentially got three main arguments that he wants to get across to you. He wants you to realise you have a new identity, that you can suffer as a witness, and that suffering is just part of being a Christian. All right, those are the three main things he wants to look at. So that, that first argument there is where he emphasises that new identity. You might recall Pastor Greg talking about the cornerstone and the temple, and he used lots of Old Testament imagery. This is Peter's way of inviting these people in to a bigger story and making them realise they have this new identity as part of God's family. All right, and so that second argument there, suffering as a witness, is where Peter appeals to Jesus' followers you know, that their current hardships are actually an opportunity, right? an opportunity to demonstrate the transformation that's occurred inside of them. All right, and so Peter gives us examples of what that looks like to respond to this situation for people who are in particularly difficult situations. So you might recall uh, we spoke about what it was like for wives who had non-Christian husbands and slaves, you know, and Pastor Simon covered that part of this letter. And that third argument there is where he puts their suffering, you could say, into a theological context, where he essentially says Christians should expect life to be hard. All right, they should expect suffering and persecution. And so that's really what propels this letter from beginning to end, from start to finish, that the suffering and the persecution of these people that Peter's writing to really drives this letter. And he's getting them to think through, what does all of this mean in terms of the bigger picture? You know, how should I respond to something like this as a Christian? And so... The reason I'm showing you this structure here is because the verses I'm going to cover go from that second argument to the third. So we're going to look at a bit of what it is to suffer as a witness and then that last one, they're suffering as a Christian. And so there's, there's two separate arguments there and it's just helpful, I think, to, to lay it out like that so you can see where that transition occurs. So let's step through it. So I'm going to be looking at Chapter 4, verses 7 to 19. So starting at verse 7 there, it says this, The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Carefully, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. 
the end of the world is coming soon. What a way to start, right? You know, it's, it's an interesting choice of words, keeping in mind that we're in this section where Peter wants to emphasise being a witness to other people. Why is he talking about the end of the world? You know, Peter, I think here he's placing their present suffering, their hardship that they're going through inside of a, a much larger story. The end of the world is coming soon. He's saying, change your focus. Widen your perspective. Look at this present situation in light of eternity because for us as Christians, the end of the world actually isn't something to be feared or dreaded. You know, just the opposite. You know, we should be looking forward to it. You know, and as crazy as that sounds, there is so much to look forward to. Jesus will return. Heaven and earth will be reunited. We can look forward to experiencing God's presence in its fullness, in a place where there is no more mourning, no more sickness, no more death, no more suffering or loss. The end of the world, as Peter puts it here, is not the end of all things. It's just the end of this present age. It's the end of our fractured and imperfect world. Right? And so he says, therefore, with that in mind, with the knowledge that Jesus will return and heaven and earth will be reunited, be earnest and discipline in your prayers. Let your focus return to God. Don't let your current situation distract you from talking to God. Remember your new identity as part of his family and remain self-controlled, disciplined in your prayers. He's saying start there. Start with that. And then when you've spent some time talking to God, do what he taught us to do. You know, show a deep love for one another. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, Continue to show a deep love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Right, so in light of Jesus' return, in light of heaven and earth being reunited, show this deep love for one another. Right, change your perspective. Look at the bigger picture of what God is doing and then let that inspire you to actually love each other even more, even in the midst of the suffering and the persecution that you're facing. Right, he says, even be willing to forgive each other. That word cover there, it does refer to forgiveness. To cover a sin is to forgive it. And Peter is really urging them to keep just living out what Jesus has taught them to do. And so to show this as well, I think not just to your brothers and sisters, but to everyone that you encounter. So verse 9 there says, share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. And so Peter is talking to people who are being persecuted, right? people who are suffering, and he's all too aware that when we go through something like that, some sort of hardship, we tend to look inwards to ourselves. You know, it's tempting to go into that survival mode, store up more things for ourselves and not consider the needs of other people. But Peter says, you know what? What a missed opportunity. What a missed opportunity to show other people how you've been transformed, right? What a missed opportunity to show them Jesus through your actions, and show, show people that Jesus is alive in you, you know, by praying to God, by showing this deep love for one another, by showing that hospitality to other people. He then goes on to say this. He goes on to say, what about your gifts? He goes on to say, the skills and talents that God has uniquely given you, have you considered how powerful those gifts could also be in witnessing to other people? So he goes on to say this. Verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. He says, God has given each of you a gift, so use them well to serve one another. And he's really echoing an idea that you find in many places throughout the New Testament, which is that church is about lots of different people, each with their own unique gifts and talents, coming together in one place, coming together to serve each other with those gifts people with different backgrounds, different life experiences, different skills, different ages. 
all these gifts that, pe that Peter is talking about here really speaks of diversity in the church. And I truly believe that the church functions at its best when a diverse group of people come together and serve each other with their great variety of spiritual gifts. And Peter gives us some examples here. He says, do you have the gift of speaking? Do you have the gift of helping others? You know, he wants people, or people he's writing to, to think really carefully and ask themselves, what can I do for someone else? You know, what can I bring to the table? How can I serve my brothers and sisters? And church is about everyone coming together in community. That's what church is. It's about the mutual support and care that we offer each other, the out outreach we provide to our local community, the meals we share, how we pray for each other. You know, and the way all those things come together, I think, is really unique to Christian community. And Peter wants those Christians that he's writing to, who are scattered all throughout the world, you know, to look at those things and realise how powerful they are, you know, how unique and special those things are. They are the things that people look at and go, wow, I want to be part of that. You know, I want to live for something more than just myself, like those people are doing. You know? And considering Peter is writing to persecuted Christians, essentially what he's asking is, have you considered how powerful those gifts are in your current situation? Have you considered how serving each other with your gifts will bring glory to God? You know, what a great witness we could be showing people the transformative power of Jesus alive in us, that you could do that even under the threat of persecution, you know, even when you're being unfairly treated under threat of punishment, that you could come together and serve one another. You know, what a powerful demonstration of Jesus. You know, and so he says, do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. You know, because what's on display there is Jesus. You know, what an amazing way to witness to other people. And so then Peter finishes off this, this section by saying, all power, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. It's kind of like he's finishing off a prayer, right? And in the style that Peter is writing in, this is how we know he's finished with this section. He's finished with this particular argument talking about being a witness to other people, even during times of suffering and hardship. He finishes it off like a prayer saying amen. So we know now he's done talking about this. He's going to start an entirely new argument. And so then we go on to his third and final argument, which is how followers of Jesus should simply expect suffering and persecution. Now, it's a hard thing to want to hear, but that's, that's essentially the summary of his final argument. So he goes on to say this, starting at verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. All right, so Peter, he's recalling Jesus' words here, the words he gave to his disciples, that they should consider it actually an honour and even a joy to be persecuted like he was. All right? And he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you are going through. Isn't that a great verse? This is, this is one that has been dear to my heart over the last few months. You know, I was meditating on this the other week and I was just going, well, God, I, I needed to hear that. You know? I've been feeling like I've been going through a bit of a season where there are a few trials that have come up, a lot of problems that have, that have come to me, it seems all at once, you know, and I'm sure you can relate to times like that when you've just felt like you're being attacked from every side and you're sitting there going, why is this all happening at once? You know, I can't even catch a break. And Peter says, don't be surprised. He's saying, why are you acting like something strange is happening to you? Didn't you know that when you signed up to be a Christian that you were joining an army? You know, that you were entering into a war. Did you expect it to be easy? Right? And maybe we aren't expecting this, you know? I think that when people make that decision to follow Jesus, often we're just told all the good stuff that will come with that. Jesus will be our best friend. You know, we're going to go to heaven. Life's going to be great. And all those things are absolutely true. But how often do we talk about the cost of following Jesus? You know, and I think maybe we don't spend enough time just acknowledging the cost. You know, what will it cost us to be a disciple of his? And what Peter is getting at here is that 
When we decide to become a follower of Jesus, we are entering into spiritual warfare. All right? By following Jesus, we're making ourselves a target for Satan. Now, before you made that decision to follow Jesus, there was probably no point in Satan attacking you. But when you start following Jesus, when you start doing something for the kingdom, you become a target. That's when the fight is on. You know? And I think sports always make a good analogy here. If you're playing football, right, and you're sitting on the sidelines, or maybe you don't even turn up to the match, why would the other team care about you at all? The second you start joining in, the second you start cooperating with your teammates, going for the ball, going for the goal, all of a sudden you're a threat, right? And you'll be attacked for it. And it's the same for us and our faith. And once we decide to follow Jesus, we also draw the attention of a very real enemy. And anyone who has served in church long enough will know that the more you get into ministry, the more passion you bring, the more you try to look like Jesus, also, the more you're going to feel that attack. And so in the context of this letter, we have these early believers who are following Jesus passionately, but they're scattered everywhere. And Peter says, don't be surprised by the fiery trials that you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. And the fiery trials that he's talking about here were most likely literal. Right? He's, he's talking at a time when Emperor Nero uh, was ruling over these parts of the world, and he would take Christians and burn them alive. They would be human torches in his garden. You know, what an absolutely horrific thing for a human being to suffer. And Peter, he's seeing that. He's knowing that there's that level of persecution going on. And he tells Jesus' disciples, don't be surprised. He says, we knew. We knew. Jesus told us. Jesus says in John 15, 18, the world hates you. You know, know that they hated me first. John 15, 26, he says, no servant is greater than their, their master. If they're persecuting me, they're going to persecute you also. So don't be surprised. Instead, be very glad. You know, and it seems like a strange thing to say, right? How could anyone possibly be glad in this kind of situation, especially since he's talking to people who might actually be burned alive for their faith? He says, rejoice. And Peter explains this in verse 13. He says that even in the midst of suffering, it's possible to have this wonderful joy. And that joy comes from knowing that you will see Jesus in his glory when he's revealed to all the world. And again, Peter is trying to or tying everything, rather, back to this future hope. And the thing that he ties everything back to is this future hope that we have in seeing Jesus return. And that is the source of our joy. And joy being distinct from happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness will depend on your circumstance. And in times of suffering, happiness might even be inappropriate. But you can still have joy, because joy comes from that future hope. It's that satisfaction or contentment that you have from knowing how it all ends, knowing that God has it under control. And so he's saying somehow find that joy. If you believe in what Jesus says, that joy ought to be there somewhere. He goes on to say this, if you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. For the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. And again, you might look at this and go, how could being insulted for your faith result in a blessing? You know, where, where is the blessing in that? And Peter says that that's when the Holy Spirit himself rests upon you. And as painful as it is to be insulted for your faith, you know, there is a peace that you will experience when that happens. You know, and that's the Holy Spirit resting on you. And I know for myself, the, those times where I've stepped out of my comfort zone, maybe done something a bit radical, you know, that is when I've experienced the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And for me, it's, it's been those situations probably where I've shared my faith, and in particular where I've been rejected for it. You know, at, I can honestly say that is when I've also felt the peace of the Holy Spirit resting on me. And it kills me that I've been rejected by people. But in that same moment, God has shown me something really valuable, the peace of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've had that experience of peace and it's amazing. And so, in that sense, Peter is encouraging these people. He's saying, as you're tested, as you're persecuted, as people insult you for your faith, 
in that same moment, people are going to see that you're the real deal. You know, people are going to see that the Holy Spirit is alive in you. you know, and you'll see that in yourself. You'll, you'll be able to respond to those situations, not out of anger, but out of this supernatural peace that you feel from the Holy Spirit. So Peter's saying here, don't shy away from those difficult situations because that's when God is going to come through for you. Right? And he'll give you just what you need to get through it. In those difficult times, you will also know the peace of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say this, If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs, but it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. And I think Peter here is just being very clear that the same principle doesn't apply just to all suffering. You're not going to feel the Holy Spirit for committing a crime, right? For murder, for making trouble. But you will feel it if you suffer for being a Christian. There is no shame in that. He goes on again to say this, For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So when Peter refers here to God's household, he's speaking about the church. And he's continuing this idea that as Christians, we should expect hardships and trials. Because according to the Old Testament, God generally brings about judgment, as he refers to it here, on his own people first. And there's lots of examples of that in the Old Testament. He's saying... He might allow these unjust things to happen. God might allow them to happen. But as Christians, we shouldn't look at those as a punishment from God, but as something that will refine and strengthen the church. So he's saying here, um, judgment must begin with God's household. He's saying God might use those things to help us stay on the narrow path. He might use those things to lead us towards salvation, to fix our eyes on the things that are really important in life. And throughout history, Persecution has often had that effect. It's refined and strengthened the church, as difficult as it is for us to see that happen. And so then he encourages his readers by putting this all into perspective. He says, if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? It's a reminder that even though there are so many temptations and difficulties to overcome in this life, that there is so much suffering and pain, that God has promised us salvation, right? God is there with us in those things, offering us peace and joy, as he already spoke about. And we put it into perspective, those trials won't last long. In light of eternity, they don't last long, because in the end, what we have to look forward to is something infinitely more important. You know, and so to support his argument here, he quotes Psalm 1131. It says, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? And so he's essentially saying these judgments will begin with us, with God's household, you know, but they will soon be over. It's an encouragement. He's saying your trials won't last long. Consider them to be brief in comparison to what awaits those who continue to rebel against God. And then the last verse I'm going to cover, verse 19. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. If God created us, then doesn't he know what's best for us too? No, I, we can trust him. So even though it's hard, I think he's saying here, keep on doing what is right. Keep on living in the way that Jesus taught us to live. And so there's, there's more to this last section of the letter. And next week you'll hear from Pastor Simon finishing off on that, that last section there. But I hope you've seen here that really what's propelling this letter from start to finish is the suffering and the persecution that these Christians are going through. And all the time Peter is tying it back again and again to this future hope. And in that context he's making these two arguments. We've looked at suffering as a witness and then suffering as a Christian. And so he's saying... If you're suffering as a witness, there are times of persecution and suffering, but we should look at those as an opportunity. You know, as crazy as that sounds, it's an opportunity to show people how we have been transformed, 
how we're different. Persecution offers us a chance to show others the generous love of Jesus. And the second argument he's making is just the fact that we suffer for being a Christian. He's saying we should expect this. We should expect suffering and persecution simply because we have chosen to follow Jesus. So as you meditate on those yourself, I pray that you'd take to heart what those mean and how you'd apply them to your own life and that your times of hardship might actually be times of opportunity to witness to other people and also to not be surprised. Don't be surprised when these fiery trials come your way. We should expect them simply because we've chosen to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this journey we've been on in the book of 1 Peter, in this letter, Lord, written by the Apostle Peter. I thank you, Lord, that we have such a unique insight into the encouragement that Peter is giving these people in a time of great hardship and suffering, people who are being severely persecuted, giving up their lives, being imprisoned for you, Lord, simply for being a Christian. And so as we consider this, Lord, I have to admit that most of us here would probably say that we've never experienced any sort of persecution like this. We've never really suffered like the people we read about in the Bible. But I thank you, Lord, that you're giving us this unique insight, that you can still show us that when these hard times come, when there is this persecution, when we're insulted for our faith, that we have this opportunity to respond to those with your generous love. And so I pray, Lord, that we would take that close to heart and we would look at those times not out of sorrow, but as an opportunity. As crazy as that sounds and as upside down as it is, this could be an opportunity to show people the generous love of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us in those times. I pray, Lord, that even though we're expecting this to come, that we won't be surprised, Lord, that you would strengthen us when that comes, that we would feel the Holy Spirit rest upon us. And in those times of hardship, that we would feel that peace, Lord. In your name. Amen.